have Professor Thomas Hartung with me. He's the director of the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing at Johns Hopkins University. And I have Professor Meryl ritzkes hotinga with me today, and she's from Ut Ut Utrecht University. And she has a very exciting um, new position there, and she will talk more about this. And we have Dr. Gavin Maxwell with us from Unilever. And um, they all have different yeah, career passes, um, and they will talk to us in the first round of this discussion um, yeah, how they came to where they are today. And um, I'm very excited um, to hear from them and learn from them. Our first speaker will be Thomas Hartung. The floor is yours, Thomas. Okay, thank you very much, Katrin. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Welcome from my home in Italy this time, not from Baltimore. Um, my main appointment is with this, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, where for almost 41 years now, we have the Center for Alternative Standard Testing. Um, and you see these masks we actually printed during the pandemic, and it has a very good tagline for me, which is saving more than animals. Because it's very important to me, I'm a physician in the leading school of public health, and what we are doing is not just for animal welfare, um, but it is for um, science and society. Um, I have to mention that I have a couple of conflicts of interest. Um, I will be brief here, uh, take everything what I say with a grain of salt. I'm trying to get um, alternative approaches accepted in many layers and uh, areas from microphysiological systems to artificial intelligence uh, to pyrogen testing and others. Okay. Um, I was asked to tell a bit of how I came, where I am um, now. Yeah, almost 40 years in the field of alternative methods. <clears throat> I studied um, in Tübingen and um, later in Konstanz uh, in Germany, um, biochemistry, medicine, um, mathematics and informatics, uh, MD, PhD. Um, and I created together um, this Marcel Leist Cut Europe, a center for terms to animal testing in Europe, which is a joint venture with the, of the original cut I'm directing in Hopkins. Um, and the University of Constance. I had an interim period from 2002 to 2009 here in Italy, uh, where I directed the European Center for the Validation of Alternative Methods. And since 2009, some incredible 13 years already, um, twice as long as I was in ECWAM, I'm directing CAT. Um, I put up the five professorships I'm holding at the moment. And I didn't do this to brag about uh, this, uh, but I, uh, I think it was very, very satisfying for me personally um, that when early in my career, many colleagues and especially reviewers from German Research Council and others told me, why do you waste your wonderful career as a pharmacologist, toxicologist, and focus on uh, these animal welfare issues? And in the meantime, um, I found my place not only in academia, but these very institutions have given me lifetime achievement awards for, uh, for my work. So uh, obviously it is not a bad thing to invest your career into alternative methods. Um, I've always been interested in policy and we are running policy programs in the EU and the US because um, it is not only about the next scientific paper, um, but it is also um, about making legislations which allow us to uh, make actual change and achieve something, get the rubber on the ground. And it's all about tangible products. In our own labs, we are working on organoids of the human brain to find causes of autism and others. Uh, we use omics technologies uh, like metabolomics, and we are also very much vested in artificial intelligence, and I will mention a few of these things in a second. But the first thing to let say, uh, set the ground, um, I think we should all be aware that roughly half to a certain majority of people are opposed to animal testing. And this holds both in the EU and in Europe. In the US where people are on average 10% less um, supportive for um, banning animal testing, 70% in recent polls said they don't want animal testing for cosmetics. And eight federal states in the US have already banned animal testing for cosmetics. So there is movement and this forces politicians um, because the public opinion obviously matters to them. And we see more and more announcements of programs to get rid 
of this or who emphasize, at least in the legal text, uh, very much the availability of alternative methods on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, animal tests have been introduced, those on rats and mice, largely in the 20s of the last century, before nobody was using them in, in, in um, large numbers. Um, the knowledge in the life sciences, biomedicine, is doubling every seven years. This means that by now we have about a thousand times more knowledge um, than we had when we installed these animal tests. So I think there must be technologically something in the box to actually do better um, as you're not 70 kilogram rats. As a center, we have a lot of classes on the three Rs and here Katrin Herrmann plays an instrumental role uh, leading some of these classes before full-time and I'm very fortunate that she's continuing to work with us also now and uh, giving some of these classes because we feel this needs to get out to students, the next generation. Um, in order to achieve this, really, we have put two of our major classes, 13 lectures each, on Coursera. And in less than four years, we have had more than 15,000 active learners on Coursera, because this free platform allows to get information about these things. And this demonstrates, I think, very nicely that there is a global interest in alternative approaches and to learn more about them. So if you're interested, put in Coursera and toxicology, and you will instantly find uh, these classes. Um, it is important that we see the entire field as an interplay between science, politics, and the public. Um, and it is very important that science is informing the political process, and that politics, which is setting the boundaries and deciding where the money goes, is at the same time um, instilling the willingness for change towards alternative approaches. And social media and media serve as a catalyst in this discussion between the three. And uh, at the same time, we are trying to promote um, something at the moment, which is what we call outreach or engagement, uh, because we think we are talking too much to lay audiences and say, it is like this, but this is now you get how you get buy-in. So we're trying uh, our best at the moment to develop approaches where we can engage um, a broader audience into these topics. Um, I mentioned already that we have policy programs. This is our European policy program. And um, I'm talking on average once per year in the European Parliament um, because of our door openers. Francois Vesquet here um, is doing this. Uh, this is really important because there's messages to give. Um, Europe is very proud that they banned cosmetic testing on animals. Uh, but when we analyzed last year in more detail, we found that an enormous number of chemicals has in the most recent time be tested um, because of other legislations. The chemical legislation REACH is an example. The Guardian took our study up and, uh, and several other journals, and we found um, 3,200 chemicals, which were completely normally registered because they have beside cosmetics other uses, and we found 400 which have only cosmetic use, and, um, and uh, 36 uh, of them were actually tested in animal tests after the cosmetic deadline. Um, so this means um, we have to do something to really implement what politicians, consumers, and the industry alike want, which is to move to non-animal methods for cosmetic products. In general, I think um, a very important message from my ethical problem, we have to see this as an um, economical one. And it is quite fascinating how much of this already is taking place. Um, in toxicology, for example, which is one of the most conservative areas of animal use, um, we already have about three and a half times more uh, investment into in vitro toxicology than we have into in vivo toxicology. And we see that the pharma industry, which is under the strongest pressure to have the most up-to-date methodologies, the best predictive methods, because they are talking about billions of investment, they drop animal tests in an enormous speed. This is one piece here between 2005 and 2011, for example, with increased spending overall in research budget, the European pharma industry reduced 40% of their animal tests. Um, this was just a six-year period where we have happened to have good data the, from the statistics. 
But at the same time, there's a lot of stuff which requires testing where we don't, when we cannot serve society fast enough. I just brought up here the flavors in e-cigarettes. There's more than 7,000 of them and hardly anything has been tested for the safety of consumers. And if you take this economical view, <clears throat> then it is really ethics becomes a marketing aspect. It's part of corporate culture. Safety has something to do with liability in courts. Science is something about product development to get the drugs which really work in humans, which not only cure mice and rats and then fail in humans, as 95% of drugs do. And regulation is also trade policy. Um, by setting standards, um, we are also regulating what goes to our markets and what does not, and how can uh, do we exclude uh, others also through animal legislation. So <clears throat> the key message is um, it is a primary societal need that biomedicine is delivering. Um, so we need models. Uh, we need models for the different diseases, um, for different uh, aspects of disease, the genetic impact, the infectious impact, but also the exposure side of things, which is in the largest sense toxicology. And the important message, first of all, is we are not 70 kilogram rats. And for this reason, uh, we have to leverage science uh, as we cannot test on humans. Um, so we need to do something about this. And at this point, I would like to stop and we'll take, um, take this up again and we'll tell you a little bit more what we can actually do, the technologies we have available um, as soon as we come to the second round. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here to speak and take part in this panel debate. And uh, the next 10 minutes will be on the story of my life and towards total replacement of animal studies. I have recently started a new position as professor in evidence-based transition to animal-free innovations at the Institute for Risk Assessment Sciences at Utrecht University. And it is a really challenging uh, position, which I love to take up and take you through my life cycle to, to tell you why I came about to, the, to come to this position. So here is my life cycle, and I will guide you through the story of my life and then tell you where I am in this life cycle during my talk. So I start at the top with a publication on atherosclerosis in the red, how it all started. When I'm 25 years old, I'm near my graduation at FET school in Utrecht. I'm performing my master thesis at the Department of Laboratory Animal Science. And I'm really astonished of what I find when I digest the scientific publications on the use of the rat as a model for human atherosclerosis research. I do not yet know a lot about science, but I am shocked by reading how poor the quality is of so many publications on animal studies and how little good argumentation lies behind the choice of animal models and experimental procedures. Also, I noticed that animal welfare is hardly taken into consideration. I'm then 25 and wanting to do something about this, which lasts for the rest of my career. My lifelong mission is born how to achieve better quality, better animal welfare, and better predictive animal studies for the benefit of all. The solution I choose to work on is on furthering the three arts, replacement, reduction, and refinement. But as I still believe animal studies are useful for humans, my main focus is on refinement. Trying to improve quality of science and the welfare of animals used in experiments, contributing to the relevance of the results for humans. My PhD at the Department of Laboratory Animal Science at Utrecht University focuses on refinement. So you see on the top right, the arrow to the right, and there you see the topic of my PhD. I then move on to work at the Unilever Research Laboratory near Rotterdam, where I learn how industry works, which is a very rich experience. 
The management structures are much clearer than at university and the quality of scientific practice is higher. I learned to work with good laboratory practice guidelines, which basically make sure that everything you do is well planned, executed, reported, documented, and archived. It requires good team meetings with everybody involved before doing any experiment. Academia in general opposes good laboratory practice guidelines, claiming this is unnecessary bureaucracy. I totally disagree. In case we want to do good science, we need to plan, execute and report every, everything carefully in detail in order to be able to draw valid scientific conclusions. As I wish to continue my career in academia to pursue my mission, I find a new job at the University of Southern Denmark in Odense. You see the picture on the bottom of this figure. I become the head of the Central Animal Facility and professor in laboratory animal science and comparative medicine. Together with the staff and researchers, we make some productive steps in implementing the three R's in education, research, and publications. After 10 good years in Denmark, I become the head of the animal facility in Nijmegen and professor in laboratory animal science. You see the picture on the left bottom. My license holder for animal studies thinks my three R work is really important and gives me funding to start the 3R Research Center, providing service in the field of the 3Rs to researchers. After two successful years, the 3R Research Center has to own their own money. And I then find out that researchers are not willing to pay for 3R actions, claiming that there is no time, no money for the 3Rs. Although the three R's are a legal obligation, there is no time, no money for them. My conclusion after all those years is that striving to implement the three R's is not effective at all. I therefore take the step towards setting up systematic reviews for animal studies, as this method leads to the three R implementation and a lot more. This method of critically evaluating the scientific evidence that is already out there is mainstream in the clinic, forming the basis of evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine studies whether there is evidence that a certain treatment in humans really works. Surprisingly, this method is not yet broadly applied for animal studies even though a lot of animal studies are claimed to contribute to better human medicine and many regulations require animal study results. I see a lot of huge promises of animal studies, which can also lead to devastating problems in humans. So it is totally beyond my understanding that the evidence from animal studies is not required nor obligatory. For example, side effects of drugs are reported to kill 197,000 people per year in the EU. And all these drugs have been tested on animals first. 90% of positive results of new drugs from animal studies subsequently fail in clinical studies in humans. This really needs a close investigation on what is going on here exactly. CIRCLE is founded, a dedicated center for education and research in preclinical systematic reviews. It is very unfortunate, but the systematic reviews of animal studies make even bigger problems transparent. 50 to 80% of publications on animal studies do not mention essential details. And many animal models and studies do not predict what is happening in humans. And for Alzheimer disease, a failure rate as high as 98% is reported. So systematic reviews make my mission even more challenging. And moreover, I'm not at all becoming popular by making all of this transparent. 
it puzzles me that our academic education seems to be failing, making us believers instead of critical scientists. More worryingly, although this is all published, we do not yet see real improvements. Industry seems to be far ahead of academia. For example, the pharmaceutical company Sanovi Aventis announces a global commitment to 50% reduction in animal use from 2020 to 2030. Knowing all this, after 35 years of experience, my conclusion is to stop animal studies and give full focus to the transition to animal-free innovations which is the abbreviation you see on the left top, TPI in Dutch. Transition science is the way to go. Transdisciplinary science is needed because the evidence that animal studies do not translate is not enough to stop animal studies. I'm very happy that I'm involved in two projects that have just been awarded today on animal-free safety assessment building the virtual human platform for safety and implementing replacement through transition science and transformational governance. Evidence alone is not effective. The rabbit pyrogen test alternative is a clear example. A well-validated test becomes implemented 25 years after validation. There are obviously a lot of complex hurdles that need to be solved, as there are a lot of stakeholders and processes involved. My new mission is to let the world make this transition as fast as possible. Thank you very much for your attention. First of all, thank you very much for the organizers of this session, for the invitation to speak. Um, like, like Meryl, I'm going to start off by uh, taking you through some uh, background in terms of my career and, and how I came to be here today. So, so my interest in, in toxicology and the challenge of non-animal safety science started back at university where I was very interested in disease mechanisms and disease prevention. And at that point, uh, I focused my degree studies on immunology and immunopharmacology. But what I've found as I got deeper into the research culture through my PhD was that I became increasingly disillusioned by the, the focus on mouse models, particularly within immunology research, that ultimately meant a lot of the work we were doing didn't have a huge human relevance and therefore for me had very little real world benefit. That led me when I, I concluded my PhD studies to, to join uh, Unilever Safety and Environmental Assurance Centre, or SEAC, back in 2004, uh, to work on non-animal approaches for consumer safety risk assessment. Um, and really I've been working on that area ever since, working on what we call new approach methodologies or NAMs uh, for next generation risk assessment. Um, particularly on skin allergy or skin sensitization, where I've been lucky enough to stay involved in that topic for uh, almost my entire career. Um, currently, in addition to my Unilever roles, um, I'm industry co-chair for uh, the European Partnership for Alternative Approaches to Animal Testing, EPA, and I also um, I'm working quite intensively to help launch a new science program to support global use of NAMS and NGRA for cosmetic products and ingredients uh, by developing a new consortium. And if you're wondering why there's a penguin and an iceberg at the bottom of this slide, it really comes back to uh, the work of John Cotter on change. And, and really that's what we've um, used to guide the, the Unilever work in this space ultimately as we've made the transition from traditional approaches to uh, entire dependence on uh, next generation approaches. So, so what is our, our policy and our approach? Well, what we believe is that, of course, every Unilever product must be safe for people in our environment. We're a consumer goods company. Our products are used um, in many different ways and, and cover many different types. <clears throat> Excuse me, but ultimately animal testing is not needed to assess ingredient and product safety. And so we use a wide range of non-animal alternatives to, to fulfill those data requirements. 
how, how are we able to do that? Uh, well, we've been investing in this area for over 40 years. We've always done this in collaboration with many organizations. Our current, current partnerships are up uh, over 70. And we've always worked to share everything that we're doing. So our publications over that time have, have been over 600. And really what that's allowed us to do is, is make that transition I talked about, which is our safety approaches are entirely based on next generation risk assessment approaches and have really left behind the, any focus on traditional risk assessment and any kind of aim to, to predict an animal test result. In order to do that, we've uh, adopted and, and applied the concepts that have been developed by the US uh, National Academy of Sciences, first published back in 2007 under the toxicity testing in the 21st century, a vision and a strategy, and of course, updated and evolved ever since through a number of initiatives. Um, and what that's allowed us to do is, is to take the latest um, science, non-animal safety science, and, and apply it to our day-to-day -day safety decisions. So what do I mean by that? Well, ultimately it's that we aim on achieving protection. Uh, we're not interested in predicting animal test data. The hypothesis that underpins the NGRA or next generation risk assessment is that if you don't see any bioactivity um, at consumer relevant um, exposure concentrations, then that we wouldn't expect to see any adverse health effects. So what we do is aim to um, uh, combine this new exposure science and an understanding of human biology to really start to create uh, charts like the one you see above here, taken from um, a US EPA publication in 2010, where we're comparing um, the, the, the biological equivalent uh, ratios with uh, the actual exposure we predict to see and, and ultimately calculating whether we see a safety margin and wherefore whether we believe the risk is acceptable. So what kind of tools are we, am I talking about here? Well, this is a next generation risk assessment framework that was published back in 2017 as part of the SURAT1 um, activity uh, EU framework seven project. You can see the different tiers on the left there, um, starting with identifying the use scenario, the chemi chemical of concern and collecting and existing information, moving down to hypothesis formulation um, to create an ab initio risk assessment approach, and then ultimately applying that approach through uh, generating exposure and uh, bioactivity data sets to ultimately predict a point of departure and hopefully calculate a margin of safety. Now, what you can see on the, the right hand side is a range of different NAMs or non-animal safety approaches are involved in this uh, approach. Starting at the top with, with simple, quick and relatively well established approaches as, as shown by this green highlight. But as you move down, you can see these are approaches that are, are more complex or more likely to be applied in a bespoke way in order to characterize the toxicity for a particular ingredient or exposure scenario. So what do these look like in theory? Well, here's four examples um, from Unilever that cover a range of different effects. What you can see is that these are all tiered in a similar way to the, the previous diagram, but we're just sharing them in a horizontal way rather than a vertical. And these are all areas that we're obviously actively evolving and evaluating. Um, and we're doing that also in partnership with others. So we work with the US EPA and we've been lucky enough to be working with Rusty Thomas's group since 2015. Um, and we work with them on our systemic framework. Um, and we're also working with the NICETAM group um, to help us uh, go beyond our internal evaluation of our skin sensitization framework. And, and help submit that evaluation to the OECD. So what this allows us to do if we look at our overall approach is that we replace the need for animal testing through applying the latest safety science. 
Um, we share all of that work. It's available uh, on our website, tt21c.org, but we also give active presentations like this one, um, as well as obviously publishing everything we do. Where our brands uh, want to make cruelty-free claims, they do that in partnership with animal welfare NGOs to, to accredit those claims. And we also work with a range of partners to support wider acceptance and use of alternatives to animal testing. Because ultimately, what we're trying to advocate for is to work towards ending animal testing for consumer products worldwide. And so that brings me to the, to the challenge from our point of view, which is really this, the science in this space, is, as Thomas has nicely illustrated, has moved forward very rapidly. And the regulations often haven't kept pace with that change. So we now have a gap between the, the, the non-animal safety science that's available and how much of that science can be applied to regulatory decision-making. And this gap is particularly pronounced um, in the interface between the EU REACH legislation for chemical regulation um, and the cosmetic product regulation in the EU. Um, as Thomas already mentioned, the EU uh, cosmetic product regulation was, was one of the first to, to implement animal testing bans. Um, and ultimately there's been a complete ban on the testing of cosmetic products or ingredients um, from 2013 onwards. But what we still see is because of the, the need to fulfill reach information requirements and apparently due to the, the, the lack of acceptance of alternative methods, we see a large number of cosmetic only ingredients being tested. And this, as Thomas mentioned, was published by his, by his team last year and has received quite a lot of attention. So what we do in order to advocate for a change is we're also keen to, to see a, a widespread roadmap be implemented to support real systematic change in this space. So if you're interested uh, to know more about what we're doing in this space, here's uh, the Save Cruelty Free Cosmetics European Citizens Initiative that was launched last year by our Dove brand, The Body Shop and over a hundred animal welfare organizations. Uh, really calling upon the Commission to protect and strengthen the cosmetics animal testing ban, transform EU chemicals regulation and modernise science in the EU. And you can see that there's a number of suggested actions to really help um, move this transition forward. Because as Meryl has spoken about, this is really a transition that we need to start making coordinated actions around. We have a number of challenges. Uh, to support organizations as they make this transition and we all need to work together in order to make that happen. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, maybe this is a good uh, opportunity to talk more about the um, the citizens um, initiative, the European citizens initiative uh, that is currently still running. Um, I think many of you know that this is a tool of direct democracy and anybody who is a member of, uh, lives in a EU, EU member state uh, can use this tool and it's a mechanism that aims to increase direct democracy and it, it enables every citizen of the EU to participate directly to, uh, in the development of EU policies. And um, maybe Gavin, you can say a bit, little bit more, um, you know, just what, why they included more than just the cosmetics, because obviously the cosmetics is like the starting point. But um, yeah, why, why is it the time? I mean, you touched on several points already, but why do you think uh, the organizers included even more points uh, that they are asking for? Well, I, I think as I touched upon, this is really a situation where there's been a lot of progress made within the cosmetic space, but we haven't managed to translate that into um, a wider set of discussions in the chemical safety frameworks that exist. So particularly REACH and CLP within the, the EU, um, we really need to start to look and see how can we increase the ability to use non-animal methods to fulfill those requirements, but also how do we support that change 
So you can see here, and if you're interested to, to sign the, the uh, ECI, then the QR code I've put on the screen right now, you should be able to uh, hold your phone up to the screen and click through uh, using your camera app. Um, but you can see here the number of actions that are, are laid out are really about not just immediate actions about we need to stop uh, testing on cosmetic ingredients, but it's also about how do we translate that large investment that's been made into a series of uh, actions that can ultimately translate the knowledge that's been uh, developed, the capabilities that have been developed into new chemical regulatory frameworks, ultimately culminating in that last request, which is towards a, ro a roadmap to phase out animal testing uh, across the EU. And this was something that the European Parliament uh, overwhelmingly supported in their request last year um, to, to really implement a roadmap around animal-free um, innovation. And do, can you speak a little bit more about um, next steps? Um, what yeah. do you expect if, if this uh, initiative is successful? Well, what, what it would be lovely to see is um, really a, a commission coordinated effort in this space. Um, as you can see, these are a number of, of proposals. What we would expect to see is if the, the, the ECI is successful, and at the moment we're at 1,278,000, I think roughly. Um, that, so our hope would be that we've met the threshold, but we really want to get as many signatures as possible, is that I think it's within six months that the commission responds to, to this. Um, so we would hope to hear back from them in terms of what they see as um, a way forward and how they will take this, this input forward. But I think okay. it's, it's, as Meryl and Thomas said, this is, I, I think, something that's actually universally being asked for, to be honest. I think this need for us to think about the changes we now see in a more systematic way and coordinate a transition is really what's needed to support everyone who's involved in this change, which is really a kind of multi-stakeholder situation at this point. Yeah, yeah I hope what I've seen is, uh... Uh, this is an, in the end a win-win-win. It is not yeah. just the welfare groups winning. Uh, it is about getting modern science to use uh, to update our safety box. Um, it is about making more safe products, not less safe products, but to get rid of some um, outdated uh, types of tests. And uh, I'm excited that in this triangle of public policy and um, and and science. Once again, the public is taking here an initiative to, uh, to implement change. And I'll, I'll take it then, because I think if anyone has scanned, if anyone wants to scan the QR code, they've probably done it by now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I actually I actually put it also in the chat for everybody uh, to well can have done. a closer look. Um, yeah, I think it's, it, yeah, maybe we can talk more about why we need such an action plan um Meryl had some like shared some of her experiences why like she she experienced that things didn't work but still they wouldn't change um I think in the second uh talk she will tell us more about how we can maybe transition <laughs> so that's and um but I think it's I think it's something some people might be surprised about I think today we don't only have scientists joining but also uh, people from the general public who don't understand that academia is pretty conservative or science is pretty conservative and um, not so evidence-based as you would hope sometimes. Um, do you want to add something on that? I mean, Thomas, you can, uh, you have very impre impressive experiences in this um, area with your pyrogen test, but I guess you have many more examples how long things take to change then, because that was actually a question that was sent to me by email. Um, how can we close this gap between now we have certain NAMs, new approach methodologies, non-animal methods, just to, to say what this abbreviation stands for again, and still it's hard to, to get regulatory approval. Um, do you want to? Yeah, this is, I think this is the 
the point, yeah, uh, science is developing very fast. We see this in all areas of the life, yeah. Um, but people are not able to cope with these technologies so as fast as they actually arrive. And the safety science is an extreme example of this. Um, I was a young postdoc in uh, 1995 when I developed the pyrogen test. Um, and only now, in the next three to four years, animal testing in this area will be phased out. My test has not changed. If you had told me as a young postdoc that I have to wait 30 years to see um, that the things I'm working on are actually being used, um, I would have probably given up in this field. Um, in 2018, uh, we were already down by 80%. This is something, but why, didn't, why not just do it? Yeah, uh, It's something you don't understand. And I think the, the very important thing for the roadmap is a, a lesson I learned by moving to the US. The US was far behind all things in alternative approaches. Absolutely far behind. I sometimes had the feeling I'm coming from a different planet when I was visiting from Europe and talked about our work to alternatives. And then they understood it is a technological problem, which is solving a problem. And they came up with this report in 2007 on toxicity testing in the 21st century. And then the agencies coordinated, FDA, EPA, NIH, uh, Department of Defense, they all work together in a coordinated way. And in Europe, we don't have this. Um, our agencies are extremely small. They're executing laws. They have no research branches. Um, they are not sitting together and developing strategies. Um, this has something to do with size. Um, the FDA has 15,000 employees. The EPA has 15,000 employees. Um, all of the agencies in Europe together have less than 2,000. Yeah? So this is um, clear that you can do much more if you only want. But you, the first thing is you need to talk together. You have to see the strategies and perhaps also simply adopt what others are doing. Uh, but you need something who says this is the right direction. So it, it needs to happen on EU level, obviously. Otherwise, it's not possible for, for Europe, right? So no, what I, I said we need an uh, European Safety Sciences Institute, yeah? something which is coordinating, which is helping that nice funding for some alternative methods is not all the time after five years of funding lost. Yeah? How, a few scientific publications, but nobody systematically furthering it and implementing these things. Um, this can be a virtual institute, a network. Perhaps the new park initiative um, is moving into something. Um, this is a public-private partnership between EU member states. Mm -hmm. It's very substantial funding, uh, 400 million in total um, for the next seven years. This could become exactly this. But we will have to see because it's very much uh, grassroots and, um, and, and bottom up here. Mm -hmm. and, and can you speak a little bit more? Because since we, we talked about cosmetics and I think many citizens were very happy to, to hear about the ban. And uh, can you maybe explain a little bit more what happened there? How got that ban undermined and uh, how can we change this now? I mean, the first thing is um, the cosmetic industry has become an engine of change because of a legislation which was initially seemed to be an enemy. Yeah? They didn't like to be forced out of animal testing. They wanted to go out of it, but their way. But it was too long, too slow. And suddenly we saw that strong legislation which said, we don't care. You now have simply to develop the methodologies, got this very important industry to become an engine for alternative methods. And this is something I'm I'm very happy about. Um, I often say these were the wrong victims because they did very little animal experiments already in the first place, but they simply took it up. Yeah? They made it an ethical and also a marketing um, aspect to say, we deliver to the customers what the customers want. Um, the problem is that other legislations are driven by, um, we want safe products. Many people say, yeah, if you want safe products, do the animal test. And there's a clear clash between the chemical legislation of each, which says test everything uh, what is used in larger amounts uh, and do so by essentially animal testing, despite the fact that the chemical legislation says in paragraph one, one of the three goals of this legislation is to promote alternative methods. 
Unfortunately, the people in Helsinki seem to read only until the first two goals and not until the third goal, although it's in paragraph one. Um, it is, it is, it is an, in, un, not understandable how the political will, which was so clearly expressed, is not at all honored in implementing this legislation. Um, there is a permanent downturn of alternative approaches, which are suggested by companies and um, a default going back to, to very traditional tests. And we're analyzing at the moment again, animal numbers due to reach. And I can tell you the picture is not good. Yeah? The political will is not at all implemented in the in case of chemical legislation. And can you can you explain uh, to to the listeners um, what reach has to do with the cosmetics uh, ban or how this undermined um, you know that ban? The problem is that uh, the chemical legislation uh, has nothing to do with the lipstick you're you're going to use. Um, it is not about registering a lipstick. It is about registering the chemicals which are used to make the lipstick. And these are different companies. This is not um, the Unilevers of the world who are synthesizing these chemicals. They are buying them from chemical manufacturers. And these chemical manufacturers have to comply. And they have to ensure the safety of the worker, the transport of these chemicals between their plants or whatever, or from the, uh, from, from the chemical company to the, uh, through the uh, processing company, and uh, they have fulfill, to fulfill all of these requirements. And in effect, as the, we both showed the numbers, we did not coordinate well here between uh, Gavin, but perhaps uh, this stresses the importance of this piece of message. Um, if we, as a scientific community and as a general public, do not take care, our politicians don't even know that their wonderful legislations are having no effect, that they are not really getting uh, animal free products out of Europe in the cosmetic sector because their other legislation has forced the industry to do to buy products which were tested. And, and if I could maybe build on what Thomas is saying here, I, I think the, the difference in attitude and mindset around the cosmetics challenge and what we now see in the chemicals is what we need to overcome. Um, I was involved in, in some of the scientific um, review that took place ahead of the final implementation of the Cosmetic Product Regulation uh, 2013 um, um, deadline. And what we were having as a discussion was scientifically, do we believe we have all the tools to make this ban um, implementable easily? And the answer was no, there was, there was, there was tools for seeing for skin sensitization, but not a lot else for those complex endpoints. But what changed in the cosmetics industry was we stopped trying to replace the animal test and we started trying to assure safety using the tools that were available. The mindset change of how do I do this with animal testing as truly as the last resort was taken away for cosmetics. So what you had was an ability for people to get very innovative and start problem solving with these tools. And I would say it's amazing how far you can get. And I keep saying this and I will keep saying this because I think that's the challenge. We need to encourage people to, to look at the, the chemicals regulations in the same way. How would we uh, protect people using these new tools? How do we move away from the animal test as the default and start to think about how the systems that, and the frameworks that are in place could be improved through adoption of NGRA principles. Um, there was actually a question um, on exactly what uh, Thomas spoke about the pyrogen story. Um, what can be an out of the box process to avoid another pyrogenicity story that took indeed more than 25 years to get um, the method we all um, to get validated fully used? How can things be accelerated? Multi-stakeholders mean, um, means coordination, but exactly the global coordination between all the regions, within regions, within nations, uh, shows huge uh, coordination and alignments in science and knowledge and regulatory change gaps. So I what is your, are your thoughts? Most people um, don't understand that a global industry is not helped 
by Europe accepting an alternative method. Um, it is until the last important market is transitioning, only then these methods are going to be used. Um, and this is not just US and Europe. We have, uh, we have had cases where certain doc studies were no longer required both in Europe and in the US, but it took us seven years to get Japan, Korea, and Brazil as the three most important markets in this case for pesticides, um, to get them agree on the non-need of, of a certain animal test and, and to, uh, to, to get rid of it. And, and this international coordination is so important. So we have to get rid of this arrogance of, yeah, if we decide we want to ban something, then this is fine. Um, the cosmetic industry was facing the main problem for many years now that China was requiring animal testing. Um, and to get them slowly out of this uh, is most important for the global industry uh, to be able to actually comply with European legislation. There's another question um, for Gavin. Um, how far is Unilever in replacing animals in research and in safety testing to date in percentage of animals used from total? Um, is the question, and how many animals worldwide? Um, what are the main tests you find difficult to replace, if any? Um, so sorry, I probably wasn't very clear. So we're not doing animal testing to support safety. So I, I don't know numbers, so I can't tell you what the reduction was over time. But suffice to say, today it's it's none. We we don't do animal testing uh, for safety. What what um. I think is interesting is as we're sharing um, the case studies that we're running, as we're sharing the frameworks and the evaluation of those frameworks, what I can say is that we're getting a lot of questions around particular areas like carcinogenicity and reproductive toxicology. So we recently shared our, our DART framework um, in publication and, and we're very interested to see how would we broaden out our approach to increase our confidence but I can genuinely say when we come together and we look at the safety assessments that are, are required, we, are, we always start from can we get to a level of confidence that we are protecting people using these tools? And even if we start with, okay, we're not sure how far we can get with them, ultimately we've not come to a point yet where we've said, okay, they would be benefit from running an animal test at this point. In reality, we, we probably wouldn't do that. We, I don't think we would, we would go anywhere near that. We'd probably just leave the ingredient behind. But I can honestly say once you move your mindset into you're using these tools and these are your tools, what you find is that it's an iterative hypothesis driven pro approach, it's tiered, and you find yourself doing more and more bespoke work to actually increase your confidence and you're not maybe defining your, your requirements in terms of an animal test or an endpoint. You're doing it based around that ingredient and that exposure scenario. I don't know if that helps explain the, the change in mindset. And maybe uh, each of you can, can um, talk a little bit about the different NAMs um, because there was a question in the chat because um, there are some people who, who don't know really what, what other alternatives that are used to replace animal testing. Maybe you can give some examples. Um, in, yeah, and maybe also for not only for testing, but also for research, uh, that would be nice. Before uh, Thomas and uh, Gavin give answer to that, there is an EU module 52 on the search for existing non-animal alternatives that exactly gives examples for what alternatives you can think of. So one-to-one -one replacement, complex replacement and reformulating research questions. I will put uh, the, link, the link in the chat. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. You know, I think one of the big problems in the field is that um, alternative methods started when the, to be discussed and called for when they did not exist. Um, when in 1959, uh, Russell and Birch invented the three R's, there was no real cell culture. Um, there was no computational methodologies. There was nothing really. Uh, so they sold hope, yeah. And um, most people have evaluated somewhere in their career, in, often in the 80s, 90s, um, um, what 
what is an alternative method and how, how much can I possibly rely on this? And then they said, no, these are these tumor cell lines, which are uh, purely um, doing a job. Uh, most of the technologies, which at the moment are really disruptive and which are changing the field, have been invented in most recent time. In, it was in 2006 that induced propotent stem cells were invented. 2006, this is the stem cell technology, which is enabling out us at the moment to create essentially every organ um, and to combine these organs in, by, by bioengineering. Um, 2006, that's nothing. Yeah? This is, uh, um, it, it is in most recent time. Artificial intelligence, uh, the computational toxicology, I'm very um, much interested in at the moment. Um, what do we see? Since 2012, we have deep learning and artificial intelligence is booming everywhere. Um, computational toxicology before, or even shortly after, is nothing compared to what these methods can deliver nowadays. Evidence-based toxicology, um, what Merrill was referring to, we called for this in 2005 for the first time, and then at the time people said, "What is this? What is this evidence-based medicine here?" Yeah, um, they saw this as a um, as, as completely unnecessary, and it took us uh, again uh, more than 15 years to make this now mainstream. And uh, 8,000 um, systematic reviews in environmental health in the last year uh, is, I think, good evidence. Yeah. Uh I guess I could maybe give some of the the, the simpler kind of uh, NAMs that are now being used. So if you take skin sensitization space, we're talking about things like protein binding assays. We're talking about very simple monocyte cell line uh, assays where we're looking at activation of cell surface markers. We're looking at cell stress uh, pathway markers, things like the keratinocens. Um, the complexity is actually in how you integrate that data in order to make a prediction of a point of departure and how you integrate that with exposure information. And that's where Bayesian statistics is very useful. Um, if you look to something like systemic toxicity, uh, we're looking at pharmacokinetic modeling to really understand internal uh, dose and concentration. Over time, um, if, if you're looking at things like transcriptomics, cell stress panels, where you're trying to understand the impact of your ingredient on a range of different uh, cellular stress pathways, um, things like pharmaco, um, like drug binding um, assays, where you're looking to see, is this something that could be binding at quite high affinity to known drug receptors? Um, so what you're really trying to do in order to do that, and in the tiered framework I showed you before, is you're trying to hit upon where you think the, uh, the most sensitive pathway may be. Ultimately, trying to understand is that a hypothesis you can form around a mode of mechanism of, of tox uh, toxicity around an ingredient, and you're less looking for defined to uh, pathologies uh, that you would do in a, in a traditional animal test. And can you maybe speak a little bit about the, the problems that obviously now, for example, for computational modeling, we oftentimes don't have human data and how this affects um, yeah, the prediction and everything and how we can move away from this to what's more human relevant. So, so what we will, what I think everyone is moving towards and what's been widely done is this idea of we can benchmark towards um, historical human benchmarks. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the chemical that you're assessing, you need human data for, but you need to be able to have uh, an ability to benchmark the level of bioactivity or, or maybe some aspect of the exposure to something we know about that either causes adversity or is, is absolutely, uh, uh, doesn't cause any effects in, in humans. And that's where I think we've successfully found there's an ability to, to really establish a, um, a, a, a protection um, decision on, on a lot of new ingredients, because you can find when you run them through these tests and you compare them to things that really have quite potent modes of action and, and are, are, are potent at very low concentrations, you're nowhere near that. 
Um, and ultimately what you're trying to do is find, is there anything else this ingredient could be doing, which I'm not going to be detecting with the tests I'm looking at. So I think at the moment, that's where a lot of the human data is coming in. It gives us an ability using things like Bayesian approaches to benchmark uh, against any new ingredient and see where it falls on a continuum. So I suggest that we go to your second round of um, short input um, presentations, and then we can answer more questions um, afterwards, because I think um, that will lead to more questions. Okay. Um, I left you off with, the, uh, with this slide uh, that we need uh, models. And um, I already just uh, said one of the key messages is uh, cell culture is not what it used to be. Um, Bioengineering has taken over. Um, we are bioengineering organ equivalents, things which have the function and the architecture of an organ. Um, these are two workshop reports which I'm posting here, um, which we organized, which took place in Berlin and published 2016, 2020. Um, really a worldwide community of opinion leaders came together here. If you don't want to read the long ones, uh, there was an article in Science which came out of the second workshop which is a three-page summary of why these systems at the moment are revolution and uh, getting human relevant systems uh, produced. Um, this has led us most recently to organize uh, this community. And we started a series of world summits. Um, I was joined by Susie Fitzpatrick of the FDA and Don Ingber from Harvard, the two of the pioneers of microphysiological systems. And we just held in June of this year in New Orleans, and the first world summit where this community of bioengineers and users and regulators is coming and most remarkably 65 FDA um, 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 workers did join us for this uh, for this workshop listened in um, what is happening here um, this shows you the enormous interest and like you cannot underestimate the importance for the pharmaceutical industry what FDA is thinking about these things and uh, what we're doing you're bringing this World Summit next year to Berlin um, before it goes back to the US West Coast and then likely to Asia. And so this will be now an annual conference and the community is forming here. Um, another tool which is critical is really um, big data and artificial intelligence. And again, uh, I cannot stress enough how much change this has, has coming um, while counting and dead animals is something you can do perhaps even without uh, a computer. Um, what is happening now is that gigabyte, sometimes terabyte of data are accumulated, organized from the various technologies which are developing. And with the artificial intelligence and machine learning tools, we really get things which are integrating this and making sense of these. To give you one of our own examples, just to show you how potent this is, uh, we published in 2018 a methodology which could predict the nine most common animal tests which are done. And we used the incredible number of 190,000 chemicals for which we had classifications done on the basis of animal tests, and we were 87% correct. For comparison, these animal tests on average are only 81% reproduced. So we were clearly outperforming the animal test itself um, in predicting this. And this was for good reason covered twice in science and twice in nature uh, in the course of this project. And um, this is only the beginning. Uh, we published already um, that these methods are also very good in predicting human skin sensitization, not the animal skin sensitization of the previous paper. Uh, we have just a paper in press where we showed how easily within an hour or two, uh, we could assess 4,700 chemicals which are added to food. Um, and we made 38,000 uh, predictions, which is the equivalent of 250 million of testing costs to get, um, to get here um, um, a result. And the limited validation showed we were 83% accurate again. Um, so it, it is really a tool where we can close data gaps uh, in a speed uh, which is difficult to, uh, to believe. Yeah? Um, but this is not stopping at these cosmetic endpoints of the acute and topical toxicities, the skin and eye uh, things. Um, some preliminary work not yet published, um, writing on the paper actually shows that 
even the very complex studies, reproductive toxicity, carcinogenicity, um, endocrine disruption, um, is actually very good, very well predicted uh, by these methodologies. Um, so there seems to be also a high potential for moving forward in helping us to, to put our resources on the right things and identify the problem cases. And I would like to mention that the EU project ONTOX, uh, which received funding since last year, May, um, where I'm leading the AI part, is at the moment expanding these methodologies to liver, kidney, and the developing brain. So this is, I think, really a very important technology. So let me close here um, with the quote from John Maynard Keynes. Um, I really believe it is not the lack of tools. The difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. So it's really about transitioning. And this is why I think this discussion about policy, EU, um, a public requiring this is so important because it is about implementing these things and not waiting another 30 years for having them. Thanks. So um, what Thomas and uh, Gavin have mentioned uh, is actually this lack of trust on how we can implement good evidence, for example, in regulations. And so um, in the Netherlands, the Dutch government has taken the initiative towards the transition towards animal free innovations, trying to get new approach methods implemented. And the basis of this transition science is to get uh, social sciences involved in asking questions on how can we actually reach this implementation, what is holding us back and not moving faster towards the transition. And so uh, a Dutch professor Gales has made this uh, graph on transition science. And you see at the le left bottom, the word niche innovations. And that refers to the fact that we develop fantastic new models with in silico, organoids, etc. So these are the innovations that are being done in science every day. Then if you move up this graph, you get at the socio-technical regime. That is what our legislators demand, for example. What kind of tests do they want to protect human consumers? And then at the top layer, you have the socio-technical landscape the exogenous context that is our society. What as a society do we think about science, about safety issues, about the use of animals? And all these levels, you can do uh, research at all these levels and all these levels interact with each other. And that is the transition science or uh, as my colleague Ingrid Visseren does transformational governance looking not only um, mainly at the niche innovations, but also what society thinks about things. And that way we can make changes. We've seen that with the EU cosmetics ban that I think especially the public opinion has been crucial to move toward that, that cosmetics ban. So what we need for making a real change is doing this research in finding out what's going on and where we can put our priorities to really make a move towards change. And um, I have another slide of a project at my new department where I, I started working, the virtual human platform, where based on human data, uh, a whole in silico model is based where we in the future hope to work with this in silico model only. And this project is also combining all types of sciences because you need trust and confidence in the end that the output from such a system will be acceptable for everyone. So if I then can uh, take you to the discussion a bit and challenge you a bit, what are possible solutions for the problems we are facing at the moment? And um, my statement is we need to encourage, or now the policy in, in, uh, in front of my, my, uh, my uh, sentence, but I think we need to encourage the politicians 
to go on this roadmap and take up this challenge towards phasing out animal studies as requested by the large majority of the European Parliament. There are very good reasons to do so. And as people at the Joint Research Center in Ispra have told me, the science is here. And you have also heard these examples from Thomas and Gavin. So please pick what you think is realistic as a goal to set for stopping doing animal studies. Is that 2030, 2040, or 2050? So please go ahead. Yeah, maybe while we, we wait for the last people to, to vote, I think it's, it's very important to highlight the, the amazing work that the JRC is, JRC is doing. It's actually the science hub of the European Union, um, of the European Commission, for, for those who haven't heard about them. Um, I just mentioned them here because um, there was another European Citizens Initiative uh, back in 2015, where they actually wanted to abrogate um, Directive 2010-63, which is the directive um, that regulates animal use in science. And they wanted to replace it by a more, um, yeah, um, let's say a radical one that is really focusing on replacement and uh, non-animal approaches. And um, I think this, of course, this this uh, um, this initiative didn't didn't succeed in abrogating the directive. But um, the JRC started several projects that were really helpful in furthering the three R's, for example, education and the edu educational area. Um, they, they did a lot starting with high schools and also universities for three R's education and also ongoing um, education. And also what they also did is that they identified the non-animal approaches for a number of disease areas. Um, because that's something I think we will also get into more. Um, most animals are used currently for, um, for the, the biomedical field, biomedical research and um, basic and applied research. And so it's very important to also use the NAMs in those areas. And that's why it's excellent that the JRC, um, yeah, at least now looked at seven different disease areas. And they, I heard that they are also planning now um, a database that everybody can access where all those NAMs are in and it's going to be maybe in, I don't know maybe in the next one and a half years this is available um, maybe somebody from the JRC is there and can tell us more about this um, but I just want to give you some hope that as a citizen interested in this um, you know interested in phasing out animal use in science interested in innovation and making science better and more human relevant, um, it is important that you participate in such initiatives um, because obviously sometimes you think you don't really have a say or you sign so many petitions and nothing changes. But I think um, this tool of direct democracy is a very important one and it's a rather new one. And that's why um, we wanted to talk about this today as well. So I will stop the poll now end the poll and share the results. Oh, it's about 1.30 each, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> interesting. Yeah. yeah. OK. Well, thanks a lot. And I think uh, you just mentioned, Kat, the um, the Joint Research Center. And um, I remember once uh, a term that Morris Whelan used on the collective belief system. So we are still in the phase that we believe that animal studies predict what is happening in humans. But scientific evidence has shown that a lot of animal studies do not translate well, and so many alternatives do translate well. So it's also a matter of um, again, these social sciences to see how we can help move this collective belief system towards trust and confidence in alternatives and accepting that they give a different type of result. 
I would suggest uh, there there were several questions or some questions about this in the chat. So I would uh, hand over to Gavin now for his input, and then um, we get definitely back to this topic because I think that's one that many people want to know, know more about. Okay, thank you. Um, and I was very interested in the poll results. It's really <laughs> that was a good idea, Meryl. Well done. Um, Thanks. So. I just want to take this moment just to, to reflect a bit on, on where we are at the moment, because I think we are in the midst of a paradigm change. What we are seeing is with non-animal safety science increasing in use and safety assessment frameworks starting to adapt and evolve, the change and the transition we're talking about is already well underway. And the reason I say that is, if we look at the evidence, what we're seeing is increasingly these approaches are being seen as core to decision making, whether that's for consumer safety, for, for worker safety, or for environmental risk assessment. And increasingly what we're moving from is the, the publications that were coming out maybe about 10 or so years ago, have increasingly started to move into, rather than there being theoretical strategies or vision documents, these are increasingly case studies and these are increasingly implementation roadmaps and plans that are being shared by organizations. So I think the challenge if we, if we um, go from here is to reflect on why this change is happening now how we can accelerate it and what we can each do to move it forward ourselves. So I think we've talked about these themes, so I'm not going to belabor them, but I think we need to just reflect on the aspect that Thomas brought up first, which is regulatory animal testing of chemicals in particular is increasingly seen as unjustifiable, unethical. And yet we're living through an era where we're seeing the, the predicted number of animal tests that will result from recent proposed REACH revisions are predicted to increase. Now, now, why is this happening? Well, what we're also seeing is citizens increasingly have concerns about the potential impacts of chemicals, both on their health and in their environment. Um, and I share here an example from um, the, the EU special Eurobarometer uh, back from 2019, where 85% of citizens had concern, worries about the impact of chemicals on their health from everyday product use, and 90% had worries about the impact of chemicals on their environment from everyday product use. And also what we're seeing is there's a huge change that's underway, and I saw one of the questions referred to this, around how do we move to safe and sustainable by design? How do we make the transition to more sustainable sources for these chemicals? Um, and the changes that are already underway, facilitated by the European Green Deal and the EU Chemical Strategy for Sustainability, are already seeing us transform the chemicals that we're using um, and transforming the process of chemical innovation and manufacture. So if we ever wanted to look at a, a situation that was, that was ready for a, a systematic change, I think it is now. Uh, as Thomas says, we've got the triple win here in terms of opportunities to apply non-animal science to do better. So how can we accelerate this change? Well, I think if we look around, we've had decades of deep investment and to some degree an under um, utilization of that science. It's, it's maybe been picked up within certain industry sectors or for particular use cases, but it hasn't been applied in regulatory testing systematically, particularly for chemicals. And so we need to look and see how do we share the experience from those that were able to change their mindset and make use of these approaches into those spaces where people still feel that there's no place for it or the science isn't ready. Because it's not to say that we haven't still got scientific gaps that are going to need filled, but I think we're now heading towards our end game. So it's less about talking about what needs to be done and more about how do we make best use of what's already available. 
For me, one of the areas where we need to think in a different way is about how do we apply computational science and how do we democratize to some degree the tools that are being developed and, and are, are, are widely being applied within certain organizations. Because certainly for us, the US EPA, a number of other organizations, these tools have been key for us applying NAMS and NGRA to be able to assess more meaningful real world protection goals and ultimately to visualize uncertainty in a way that helps you build confidence that these tools can be used responsibly. So in order to do this, I think we need to adapt how we validate NAMS, not just to look at the, the NAMS themselves, but also how they're integrated into a decision-making process. This would be the OECD Integrated Approaches for Testing and Assessment, or IATA concept. And I'm hopeful that there are a number of people already thinking about how to do this better. But for me, this is likely to be the key from a small um, pools of people using these approaches to them being widely applied. And then finally, this has come up time and time again, how can we reconsider and reconceptualize our chemical safety assessment frameworks to ensure that they more easily embrace use of NAMS and embed NGRA concepts? If we continue to focus on the need here is to generate data on adversity and the way that we benchmark that is through um, considering it in the context of historical animal test data, then, then we won't meet this need. We need to think about what the new approaches need to be that will help build our confidence that chemicals are safe for use and how do we fit this into the, to the innovation process. And then finally, I, I love Kat's continuing focus on how can we take on this as, as citizens. And so I, I, I was inspired to put together a slide, which is what can we all do to support this transition? How can we all play our part? Well, I think for me, I picked up on two areas I think are crucial. Now, these may be very obvious to people and I apologize if they are. But for me, the two areas that made the biggest difference is, for me is that this space of NAM use and NGRA is clearly an interdisciplinary team sport. You need risk assessors, biologists, informaticians, chemists, maths, mathematicians, statisticians, all working together in order to apply these tools in the hypothesis driven way we spoke about. The organizations that I've, I've added there are organizations that I'm happy to see have embraced this way of approaching the problem and are, and are succeeding because of it. But I think the challenge for all of us, if we're not in those teams, is how do we create, join, or, or partner with those teams to make sure we have the diversity from terms of a scientific discipline to really see this problem from all angles. And then the next area that, that's not unrelated and I was really interested in Thomas, um, your mention of the Coursera course, is how do we share our experience most widely and how do we do that in a way that it's accessible to all stakeholders to start to build consensus on what's working and what's not, what needs attention and what's okay. Um, I think CAT as an organization, well, CAT as a person, but CAT as an organization as well, uh, and amazing at doing this, at bringing people together to have discussions like this one. I'd also say the EPA is an, is an important organization for having European Commission and industry partnership around a few topics. And I've included a range of other uh, organizations, many of them animal welfare organizations that for me are really catalyzing the right type of discussions. But if we're going to make this transition happen, we need to be able to support people as they try and upscale or relearn some of the tools and techniques that they learn when they train to be a toxicologist. So how do we do that on a grand scale and how do we bring people together in the right formulations to support that learning? And then finally, um, I've already mentioned this and we've talked about it a great deal. 
But I think what we need to do is not just support calls for a roadmap to accelerate this transition through initiatives like the ECI, but also make sure that regardless of the outcome of the ECI, we all work together to move that activity forward. I think we're all seeing a clear need for this. So how can we work together to really bridge the gaps we see exist? And how can we support the various organizations and stakeholders that will need to come together and collaborate going forward? This is an area I'm actively thinking about and I'm hoping we can discuss more as a panel, but I'd really appreciate input from, from you as an audience in terms of how do you see this working and where do you see the gaps? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gavin. Um, yeah, so we have many questions and we got, again, wonderful input from you in the second round. So um, I will just go through some of the questions um, that have been pressing. And one thing I think that is confusing for the public is that there's a lot of different information online, for example, and somebody was asking about um, animal like the animal research uh, PR um, and there are websites like understanding animal research and others and um, they seem a little bit one-sided let's put it like that because nobody in this expert panel would say uh, yeah animal research has ne never helped us anything or anything but we have to be a little bit more looking at what is, is useful and what isn't and as Mel um, mentioned it's even when you do systematic reviews uh, people don't seem to follow up on the lessons learned from the systematic reviews so that's uh, astounding so what what would you say why is there so much one-sided information out there how how can we counteract how can we balance this um how can we inform the public better I would hope that systematic reviews would become mainstream to find out what scientific evidence there is out there and what works and what doesn't work. And I think if we get the scientific evidence on the table, we can have much better dialogues uh, between people that are using animals and are strongly in favor of them and people against them. So we get a more balanced dialogue. And uh, in the um, uh, funding application that we got awarded today is uh, a plan to make evidence and gap maps. And the Campbell collaboration does systematic reviews of social sciences, and they have experience in making evidence and gap maps. And so the, these are becoming living documents where we assemble the evidence and the literature and everybody can access those documents and get the information what is out there. And so if we would be able to make that move to really start doing those things, we will get much better informed discussions than we have now because it's now really opinionated, I think, instead of getting the scientific evidence on the table. So I would really hope we move that way. And, and now, actually, I mean, one one turn off of the systematic reviews is so much work. I mean, you need two people, and uh, if you have to do it manually, it's very time intensive. But now, with um, you know the new tools and um, machine learning, you can actually really speed it up. Um, there is a so lot of automation going on to yeah. speed it up, and within the clinic. They are so used to systematic reviews. So I recently came across systematic reviews that have been done in two weeks. So with experienced people and good planning, they could do a systematic review in two weeks. So it's a matter of education, learning, trying, experiencing and getting there, I think. So we shouldn't be afraid of getting, getting these things done. And do you have I mean, a course in yep. Utrecht? Sorry, uh, uh, do you, do you, will you have a course for students? Because I think the courses, you know, they, this is kind of important to, to train people. Yes, we will set it up. Uh, I just started 1st of June, so mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to get into the system again. Yeah. But we will certainly uh, offer it. And there is still the free e-learning available on systematic <coughs> review. So people yeah, can maybe, take that one. Maybe yeah. we can collaborate and, and, and also have something, uh, you know, I mean, obviously 
Cat is already doing a lot. Thomas, I think, wants yes. to speak uh, on that. And the evidence-based talks. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, we are, we are seeing at the moment a phase where um, a technology is um, becoming superfluous. We see it in early days now. This is like uh, when we switch from uh, horse coaches to cars. Yeah, uh, we did not switch from horse coaches to cars by making the the horse coaches more fancy and developing them evolutionary, but simply there was a short period of coexistence, and then uh, the better technology simply took off. But at the moment, you hear the people who own the co uh, uh, the, the coaches. Uh, talking, we need to continue using it and finding one argument after the other way. Um, it should be supported to continue using horse coaches. Um, though an objective assessment like Merrill is advocating, uh, any analysis into the performance of these animal tests shows very clearly there's a big room for improvement. They're not fast enough, they're too expensive. Uh, a small fraction of all of the chemicals which we want to assess can be assessed. And these people are hindering us in implementing the progress which has been made scientific. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I would, I think often what I'm hearing is in some cases there are valid concerns and you can engage and try and understand what, what, what is it that people feel they are missing from the NAM area. And that can, I mean, some of the OECD discussions are, are quite challenging, but you can, you can reap from them a better understanding of what success criteria people would like to see and what performance people would like to see from the NAMs. But I think if, as Thomas and, and I think Meryl are saying, if people are just unwilling to see that the NAMs have a place now and that it, it's a more advanced approach, then, it, then you struggle to maybe engage constructively with some of these groups. Yeah. I, I would agree with you instantly with them if they would use the same scrutiny to assess the old technologies. Yeah, yeah? I think But so. that's, they're simply taken as a gold standard, never validated, not yeah. even uh, to a large extent reproducibility assessed. Yeah? Um, and whenever this is being done, the new methods fare uh, favorably. So it's, it's, it's really quite impressive um, how we love our ignorance about the shortcomings uh, of, of animal tests. And I think this has to do simply with the fact that um, we don't want to recall um, and withdraw what has been done in the past. I don't think that uh, the safety assessors of the world could sleep well if they acknowledge with how imperfect tools they have been doing their work over the last decades. And, and I think ultimately people have very real concerns about not wanting to cause harm to anyone. And if your belief is that an animal test is the is the best tool then obviously you're <clears throat> going to continue to advocate for that but it is about i think how can we change minds maybe for the majority that maybe are more open but they just haven't really got that understanding yet of how a nam solution could be applied because maybe they haven't had that training or they struggle to see how they could practically do it but the interesting yeah, but thing the, here is that the adverse reactions that also occur in humans after animal testing does not seem to come yeah, across no. very much. No, I'm and not these happy. figures are impressive. So yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's a, an important research question. Why don't we want to hear that as a community? Or I don't know if I expressed that yeah. properly. But no, 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 you did. Yeah. It was, it's a good point. Yeah. One in 100 people who is hospitalized dies from adverse drug reactions, mainly interactions of drugs. One in 100 who goes to hospital for whatever cause. Yeah? If you see this number, yeah, it shows you that we do not establish safety properly. No, and, exactly. And, uh, so, yeah, and, and, so it is really... Maybe Thomas, can you speak a little bit about, you know, what, how organs and chips would help also for personalized medicine? <clears throat> Um, to help I mean, with, this is a, with the interaction of different drugs, because I think that's been, I mean, besides we have issues already, okay. but the, the interaction is something that's not really well studied, obviously. And I mean, this is something where we, uh, these are two, the two holy grails of, um, of toxicology. Um, one is um, the mixture toxicology, and the second one is the uh, interact, uh, is the um, personalized, the inter individual differences. 
Um, I can tell you, neither can be solved with animal testing um, because mixture toxicology is simply too, too many options how to mix and combine. And given the costs of animal tests, you will never be able to test a single chemical in rats on, uh, for cancer is $800,000 yeah, or euro is the same in the moment. Yeah. So it's, imagine this, yeah? And if you now start combining things, nobody can ever do it. And it's five years of work, yeah? Um, if, you, if you go into personal stuff, um, with the inbred mice and rat stems we are using, you will never see uh, into individual differences and even less relevant ones for humans. Um, but stem cells can be produced from every genetic background. Uh, we have in the uh, last year uh, somebody counted more than 3000 stem cell lines already and probably these are, uh, these are many many more in the meantime so we have batteries of genetics available and can produce our organ models from ever what we want yeah. um there was a question for you meryl mm -hmm. asking uh, which animal studies are useful and then another person asked um could we really do without any animal tests or animal experiments, better to say, because we are talking about also um, biomedical research, not only about uh, toxicity testing. What are your thoughts? Would that be too radical or would it open up, a, you know, we would all start thinking out of the box and come up with new things? I think we could decide to stop animal testing now. Um, the technology is here, the science is here. Um, I think the thinking is here. So um, if, we, if, if you look at the cosmetics ban, you can also see how much progress that brought about. So I think that decision to do so uh, could be taken. And um, I got that question, of course, uh, during teaching as well. Do you have good examples of uh, uh, animal studies? And one of the things that are, I think, um, good examples is that we found out what essential nutrients are in the diet. So by leaving those nutrients out of the diet, we found out the function of, for example, linoleic acid, which we need for building our cell membranes. So that's a clear example, I think, where we learned a lot from animal studies. But we know all that now. And so we need to move on uh, with all the new technologies. And uh, that has been in a tremendous um, development the last decades. So I think it's possible to move on. I think we just lived a very interesting example, uh, the pandemic. Um, if you develop a vaccine, um, typically it takes um, 10.6 years on average, and 6% of the projects you're launching are successful. What we have seen this is that within uh, about two years, nine vaccines were successfully developed, which had minimal animal testing, because until today, there's not really a useful animal model of COVID-19. Um, mice and rats cannot be infected. Most other species are infected very mildly and everything which makes COVID such a nasty disease and the problem, all the organ contributions cannot be studied in these models. Uh, what we have seen is that we learned about the pandemic in February of 2020. Um, and in June of 2020, the first people were vaccinated in studies. Nobody can tell me that large animal trials have been carried out when in April 2020 in nature there were still big articles about when do we get a proper animal model for COVID-19. Uh, so, uh, so this is really I think the perfect example and it's tempting to say perhaps they were so successful and so efficacious because uh, we dropped a lot of the testing we normally carry out which misleads us to the wrong uh, type of products. Just to be very clear here the um, there has not been a broad use of NUMS either. Yeah? These things have moved into human trials very quickly. Um, some of the platform technologies have been used before, tested before in animals and others, and um, a certain number of short-term safety tests has been run. Yeah? So one of the vaccine producers I talked to said, yeah, we did run it through a few uh, monkeys, um, but that's it, yeah? There was not the typical uh, looking for off-target effects, for looking for uh, optimization of vaccine formulations and all the things you typically do um, in animal studies. Uh, this all was, was simply skipped. Yeah? Um, 
They simply did it without either. And it is, uh, I think, completely misleading uh, when animal, pro-animal groups at the moment say, yeah, we saved the world once again. No, they didn't, yeah. Uh, it, was, uh, it was absolutely not the, uh, the, the contribution uh, here, but we can, must also say, um, we came also as mustard after the meal um, for, uh, with the NUM methodologies showing, yeah, we could have done it with NUMs uh, because nobody needed us either, yeah. And, and but what about what about the the chips, um, the lung chips, and um, they they yeah. played the, a role. The public, but but these publications came after uh, the vaccines were already in human trials, mm. yeah, and uh, they they simply dared. They did put it into humans very quickly, and uh, and monitored these humans tightly uh, to see possible effects. Uh, and this has been done on a large scale. I mean, these were. In, these vaccines went to 30,000 plus people each. Yeah, uh, that's, that's an enormous uh, effort uh, where you see side effects much better than in, in any animal study before. Yeah. Uh, and we we yeah. did a case study into the development of one mRNA vaccine, and it was clear that fewer animal studies were done and uh, it went sooner into humans. And I think the mRNA technique uh, especially is important because it's so well characterized. And we understand that for mRNA vaccines, you don't need to do, uh, for all the batches, you don't need to do animal testing anymore. And that seems to save many, many animals. So I think that's a, a really important progress that has been made. I guess, I guess what I see is that what the parliament voted for was this transition roadmap. What they asked for was a phase out. Um, and also what I think we have got within Europe is animal testing as a last resort. I just don't think it's been implemented in that way, in a systematic way. I, I would argue that actually if we could bring more rigor to how animal testing as a last resort is being implemented, in a lot of ways, it might come closer to bringing people with us in terms of, as Meryl, you were talking about, putting the evidence forward for how the NAMs could be used and really putting more scrutiny on any animal testing than an outright ban, which as someone who lived through the cosmetics bans, I, I think it, it does have a particular effect on people and a lot of people don't see it as a challenge. These, it shuts them down they see it as something they can't, they can't address. So I would like to see the, the phase out that's being called for in the ECI, and also I think was called for by the parliament is something for me that is a more of a, a transition as we bring more rigor to animal testing as a last resort, and we more openly question why any animal testing is still necessary. I mean, first of all, I'm a notorious optimist. Um, I'm, uh, and I see the glass always half full and I drink it. <laughs> That's the pragmatic part of the, the thing. Uh, but uh, I, um, I believe that uh, this is not linear in no way how change occurs in science. Uh, read Thomas Kuhn on the nature of scientific revolutions. Uh, this is coming uh, at some point with logarithmic uh, velocities, um, it is taking place quickly. Um, I published a paper on applying Thomas Kuhn um, twice. Uh, the last one was last September only in Altex, uh, because I believe really um, everything is there. We have the perfect storm for a scientific revolution. Um, and we will be surprised how much change there will be in, uh, in the next years because the societal needs and the technologies come together um, and are giving us something better than we had before. So yeah, we have we have many more questions. I will ask uh, a critical one because obviously I I wish we could just say we we stop animal use in science altogether. And um, what are your thoughts? For for example, there was a question about auditory sciences. Um, how can we not rely on on animals um, for that? Is there are there because obviously um, yeah, this is difficult uh, to mimic. But maybe in, in, this is a good um, yeah point here where where Meryl can maybe explain to to the audience a little bit more, especially to the ones who are um, not. Uh, working in this field, what are the problems with species differences? 
Um, obviously, sometimes you can translate uh, findings from one species to the other, um, but can you maybe explain a little bit more the nuances and um, yeah, what the, what the main problems are? Yeah, we use animals as models for human diseases, and we see an animal uh, never really replicates everything that is going on in humans. And um, we unfortunately see that from positive drug results from animal studies, 90%, uh, so 9-0, fail subsequently in clinical studies. And uh, there can be several reasons for that. And species difference is a very obvious one, but also because we see the publication quality of publications, it lacks a lot of details. So it's very hard to get good scientific interpretations of those uh, scientific results. And so there are so many problems associated, I think, with the species uh, translation from animals to humans that we need to find other ways. And one of the ways that is under development is studying veterinary patients because the diseases that uh, arise spontaneously in veterinary patients can resemble human diseases better than the induced diseases in our laboratories. And um, so we can use veterinary patients and try new therapies and see how it works and uh, then transport that to the human situation. Um, for, in the, for personalized medicine, we already see a lot of examples where cancer cells from a patient are taken out and subjected to substances and then the, the proper therapy is chosen for that particular person that uh, th that substance will kill those cancer cells. And uh, so we already see that's going around animal studies uh, to get a better applied therapy for one person. So is that a, the, the answer you were looking for? Yeah, so, so, but what, what, what do you say then when people say, okay, let's improve animal studies, you know, because that's, that's what has, like, the, yeah, the community has been trying to, to improve it, to report better, to, um, you know, try not to introduce so much bias, um, but have you seen any changes? Has this really improved the translation or... No, well, I, I indicated that I have moved away from thinking we need to, to continue with animal studies. Um, I, I have seen for 30 years um, that we have been trying to improve the quality of animal studies and publications, and we hardly see improvements, despite the fact that we have very good reporting guidelines, that many reports are published on insufficient quality, we hardly see improvements. And there have also been examples where quality has been improved a little and we don't see a better translation. So I think it's better to put our efforts on new approach methods and new approach thinking. I, I guess that just to, to build on what Meryl's saying. So, so my experience was coming to the field as an immunologist, I initially was focused on um, trying to, to almost replicate the most complex aspects of the human disease process and trying to do that in the most complex systems and trying to ensure that we created all of the, the complexity that we knew existed in the, the biology in the, in the Petri dish. And I, I think there are, and I noticed there's a question in this space, I think there's a number of ways of approaching this problem that we're still trying to figure out the best approach. One of them is we can look at what we're trying to model and, and think about a very complex in vitro system and a very complex uh, measurement system to go alongside it. The other one is we can start to look at how would we make the correct measurements in order to create a mathematical model, say, of that system. And then how can you simulate the biology and the impact of the chemistry on the biology through maths? And I think this is the opportunity we have with non-animal science, but often we approach it from the discipline or the expertise we bring to the table. 
And that's why I'm a great believer on this idea of let's put our problems in the middle of the room and create interdisciplinary discussions to see not just how we would each solve them from our discipline, but how we can work together to maybe come up with a solution that didn't exist before. Yeah, can I come in with one example that just comes up now that you mentioned it, Gavin? Uh, that's the James Lind Alliance in the UK, where the funder talks to patient organizations and makes a top 10 of what is important to the patient. And there's one example from asthma research where asthma patients said, we don't want new drugs, but we want to know how to deal with asthma attacks. And so a clinical trial was set up with physiotherapy and some people even cured from their asthma. So that way you can uh, omit all animal studies and find new ways uh, around the normal uh, development of drugs. And I think we need to open up for, uh, and, and getting different stakeholders around the table leads to opening up to other ideas. Yeah, that, that, that's two very important points you just made, I think. Um, there are several more questions um, that I would like to go through with you. Um, the new chemical strategy for sustainability is referring to safe and sustainable chemicals. In this con context, efforts are ongoing to develop a framework for safe and sustainable by design. Um, do you see a role, a role of NAMS in such a framework? Gavin, you touched on this uh, already. Um, what are your thoughts? So thank you very much for this question. I, I think it's a yes completely. We need to look at the, the excellent work that the GRC has been doing in the safe and sustainable by design space. I think a lot of the concepts that are in there are are waiting to be populated with how they could be implemented with NAMS and NGRA concepts. And really for, the, for me, this is the, the great opportunity we have here. If we can look and see how can we use non-animal science to really help support the transition to a more sustainable chemical innovation and, and other types of innovation, I think that we will have a greater chance of acceptance of these approaches. As Thomas mentioned earlier, we already have challenges with how to assess mixtures uh, using traditional approaches. I think we can bring a new lens to these problems. And what we know is that um, with new sources of chemicals and new ways of manufacturing them, we're creating quite interesting complex mixtures that we can really benefit from applying non-animal safety science to. So, I'm a great believer in how do we bring together the safe and sustainable by design discussion with this wider discussion on transition and out of animal testing. I think we will benefit a lot from doing that. And what about, um, there was another question in the chat about the regulators, how can you make them have more trust in the new methods? We, we also talked a little bit about this before and Thomas mentioned the problem that in the European Union, there is not, you know, those agencies don't have so many, they don't do their own research, they don't have so much, so many um, research staff. Um, that's a little bit different in the US, but I would say that also in the US it's going slowly um, with accepting NAMs. So what, what are your thoughts on moving forward? I mean, I, I think the challenge here, and I should have maybe answered this question um, earlier from the animal testing point of view, is really, it's, it's much easier in the cosmetic space where we have things like the SCCS notes of guidance, which are quite flexible and, and, off, and are welcoming of NGRA frameworks to evolve a weight of evidence asset, except, uh, assessment to include more NAMs. When we look at how GHS categories, for example, are implemented in REACH and CLP, what we see is if we're not careful that regulators are looking to directly predict the animal test without the animal. And so they're looking for the NAM to have the same performance criteria and ultimately have the same strengths or weaknesses of the animal test. And I think what we need to now do is, is hopefully work with regulatory groups to reconceptualize how these frameworks like REACH 
could be uh, implemented in a way that's still protective and potentially even improves protection for people in the environment using NAMS. But my expectation is they will look quite different. ESSETOC recently published a great report in this space with some, some uh, ideas around how can we transition to a framework that embraces NAMS and NGRA and fulfills REACH requirements. And that's something we're discussing within the EPA. Um, I'd love to see more ideas in this space. I think the GRC shared some early thinking in this area that hopefully we'll see more of. It's about how do we start to build a different discussion around how we want to see chemical safety assessment be performed in the future without compromising on citizen or environmental protection. That's exactly the research question of transition science, I think. What are the <laughs> barriers and the opportunities? Yeah, and get the stakeholders around the table. Yeah. That is wonderful. There was one question. Uh, Thomas is, is not here anymore, but maybe uh, you can also speak on it. It's about the, the FDA Modernization Act and the question if that uh, um, will lead to greater acceptance of NAM-based uh, evidence. Um, I recall that there was some wording changed and there was a debate about if this was helpful or not, because I heard different opinions on this, that, that it might not further the use of NAMS, but some, some people were hopeful it would. Okay. Can you speak on that, Gavin, maybe? I, I, I don't know a whole lot about this. My understanding is that what the FDR were, are moving away from is that the animal test is the default and they're much more open to seeing more novel NAM-based solutions being shared. I think, I mean, this is what I've seen is a great example of where you've seen regulatory space open up through flexibility. Uh, we saw it with the SCCS, we've seen it with the EPA, we've seen it with the FDA, Health Canada, um, Environment and Climate Change Canada. You see these um, differences of, um, you create an environment for change if you say that we are interested to hear what you would suggest if you didn't take the default path as it's currently stated in the regulation. And that's really the flexibility I would love to see other regulators start to adopt and be more open to the type of dialogue that I believe the FDA are willing to have on this topic when solutions are put on the table. I recently read that the FDA has approved a clinical trial without demanding new animal studies for a, uh, it's a repurposed drug. So, but okay. for a different uh, goal, for a different disease. So, but that's very promising, I think. And, it, and I think, Beryl, in your space, when you when you look at transitions, this is really where you start to want to look at maybe what the model is for those regulators to not feel they're compromising their independence, yes. but there's still space for that kind of dialogue. And I think this is where we need more thinking to make sure that that dialogue can happen without people feeling like it's a, it's an industry push to do the non-animal approach. Yes, exactly. Um, there was another question, what data uh, would uh, you base the in silicon, uh, in silicon in AI predictions on if there would have been no animal experiments in the past to produce those data? There was already um, a comment that human clinic data should be the gold standards, uh, standard. So how much do you think we are misled at the moment by using animal data? <laughs> this is like, I know it's an unanswerable question, but uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it depends what you're using it for, because I, I think if you're saying it's a, it's a surrogate for human data, then probably quite a lot misled. I think if you're saying it's one piece of information that could be used as part of a weight of evidence, then maybe there's a place for it. And I think from my experiences of developing mathematical models, you're, you always you often have very specific questions you want to answer and you can rate your information based on its proximity to the, the, type of info, the type of information you would like. So I think I like the question because I think it really stimulates where for me we need more uh, collaboration probably with clinicians in the human health space 
but potentially other disciplines in the environment space to create the data sets we might need to start to really model and simulate some of these more complex areas where we're not immediately seeing in vitro science can help. Then another question was, was, would you like to ban all animal experiments or just safety studies in the former? On what system would you perform basic science in immunology, for example, where hundreds of different cells and thousands of molecules, well coordinated uh, um, interactions are needed? Or how would you study zoonotic diseases, which are going to be one of the major problems of mankind? As an I mean, immunologist, I, I'm looking forward yeah, to Yeah, you. I, I set myself up for this one, didn't I? Um, I mean, from my point of view, I think um, I have studied using animal models back when I was doing my PhD, and I have done a lot of clinical work uh, subsequently where we've looked at human volunteer samples and done complex analysis of them, as well as doing lots of in vitro work, tissue model work and everything. What I would say is each system has its strengths and weaknesses. The challenge I would say is if it depends on the question you want to answer. Now, I can understand why certain of the questions are being raised as, as particularly challenging to do outside of in vivo models. Um, things like though hundreds of different cells and thousands of molecules. What I would say is what we've learned in skin sensitization, and maybe you can't generalize hugely from this, but I think it's been instructive, is that you can start to simplify some of the biology down into the, the molecular initiating event and key events. And this is this adverse outcome pathway concept. Now, I appreciate not all uh, toxicology mechanisms can be simplified down to something so linear. But I think often when we really understand what we're trying to measure, and why we're trying to measure it for a particular decision, it is possible to simplify down the, the system, whether that's an in vitro system, a, a, a complex tissue model, a more simple two or three cell system, in, in, and whether, and you can ask the question about what does it need to um, perform, because ultimately the more complex the systems, you know the, the the harder it is to standardize them. And to Meryl's point earlier on uh, good laboratory practice and how do we make sure these decisions are robust and reproducible and able to be used in regulatory decision making. One of the benefits of having very simple systems is they tend to be easier to, to uh, translate into test guidelines that can be used widely. And some of the challenges is how do you take a more complex system into that space? If we're in an experimental research, maybe we don't need to standardize it as much, but I just think that's one of the opportunities for maybe to look at the questions differently and not assume the only way to study them is uh, using animal models. Do you want to add to this, Mera? Well, I agree what Gavin has said. It's very important to ask yourself what the research question is and then uh, discuss how you can answer that question. First, what research method do you need? And not immediately say you need an animal model or an animal study. And um, concerning the immunological uh, studies, I heard a, a lecture by uh, Donald Ingber from the Wise Institute. And I think they can do a lot with human organoids already, yeah. also in the COVID research. And they got very good data out of that. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. I would also say, just to build on it, using genetically inbred mouse strains isn't a particularly good way of reproducing the, uh, the kind of genetic diversity we have in human populations. Mm -hmm. And I think there's lots of lovely studies showing uh, exactly the challenges about trying to extrapolate from those types of systems. So I think we just need to be conscious that um, maybe sometimes we get nice experimental results from these systems because we've controlled for more things than it's useful to control for. Yeah, and, 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 and as Meryl said, I mean, to, you, you don't, we, we have to move away from this default model, the animal, and uh, just first look at yeah. all the possible methods and then 
figure out what is the, the most uh, adequate. Um, also speaking on zoonotic diseases, unfortunately, it looks like we will deal with more of those and um, those are um, evolving or developing also in our industrialized way of keeping animals on farms. Um, but there, I would also hope we take a more preventative approach in trying to change also the way we produce food and um, we treat animals overall, because obviously uh, COVID was an example for that, that. And there are many other examples, many diseases are actually originally came from other animals um, we are dealing with infectious diseases and um, we could have avo avoided a lot if we would change our treatment of other animals and our use of other animals so I like actually your colleague's approach Mel um, I heard her speak um, Ingrid I heard her speak um, about that I think it was an event of the European Commission where she looked at it more holistically because exactly. I don't think we are going to be able to solve our medical problems we created for ourselves just by innovation and better methods. I think we have to really, yeah, we have to live a better life and we have to also control for pollution and, you know, just not live in such a toxic environment. And I think this is, you know, when, when Gavin was pointing out what, what everybody can do for themselves, I think we can do a lot I mean, I, I'm not saying we can prevent everything. We all have to breathe this air, drink the water and so, so on, but we can take a lot of preventative measure, measures to improve um, our, yeah, our, our chances of, of not getting sick in the first place and not developing those common diseases now um, that are um, often caused by our lifestyle also. So I think that's also something and also, as you say, these transitions, they influence one another. We actually had a discussions about that yesterday because Ingrid is also into sustainability. And so <laughs> zoonotic diseases really come from, yeah. from the way we keep animals in, 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 in huge numbers. And so all these transitions are ongoing and also influencing each other. So um, it's, uh, again, these these transition sciences in different fields that also need to interact. That's, that's actually a very, very important point. I think that, that, yeah, we have to really approach it from a more holistic uh, standpoint. And um, yeah. And one other question, I mean, that's something that obviously uh, we also touched on is um, um, the, the teaching, how we can we improve that? Um, you know, because obviously at the moment, I think the problem is that there are more people trained on using animal models than NAMs, and that's why we don't see the shift away from that. Um, what do you think? How, what can we do with the limited resources we have? And Yeah, there's a clear need for a change in our academic educational system, because um, it is still very much focused on animal studies. So um, that needs to be introduced into the curriculum that you can do things differently and how you make organoids in the lab and stuff like that. So there's a huge uh, task here, I think, for academic institutions to get that introduced into the curriculum. And changes are taking place, uh, at least at Utrecht University, where I'm now at, uh, at the advanced toxicology courses, they introduce many of these new uh, thoughts and systems. So, um, but I think universities um, should act faster. That's for sure, to make the change. And I, and I do think we need to, we need to acknowledge the size of the change we're talking about because we're not moving from, um, we're encouraging people to move to a space where they take a more hypothesis driven and open uh, approach to how these problems are solved. So, so the, the teaching maybe doesn't need to be as prescriptive as some of the, the historical continuing education training has been. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, there's all these NAMs and here's how they all run. Some of that is useful, 
But I think what we want to be able to encourage people is to give them the, the problem solving capabilities so that they can ask the question of how do I answer this question? And they are, they are provided with the, the support in the organizations where they work to, to really um, work those questions through. Because we've definitely found the benefit of uh, doing this in a team-based way and not expecting people to, to just uh, learn these new skills and apply them on their own. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a really nice opportunity to see how can we call upon um, our larger organizations to support this transition through kind of both investing in education, but as Meryl says, maybe slightly reframing what that education is. Okay, so I will ask some of the top rated uh, questions now, so, so we don't uh, stay here for another few hours. <laughs> we don't stay all night. Uh, yeah, there's a, that's a very long, uh, yeah, but basic research still in Germany, uh, like the numbers are rising for, for in basic research for using animals. Um, yeah, also again referring to this one website, um, the, uh, Understanding Animal I think it's called Understanding Animal Research, together with the German Science Foundation announced in their position paper that there will be uh, the need of, like the first, like it will be a continuous need for animal experiments. I actually also read this position paper, but um, they ignore a recital, a recital 10 of the EU directive where it says that the final goal is to, is full replacement, or at least um, not using live animals anymore. Uh, since these basic research scientists show no motivation at all to work towards this goal, um, so they will still announce the standpoint that animal experiments are necessary, or of, of course it's self-serving, um, they won't change their way of thinking nor their way of doing research. Since the majority of members of the animal ethics committees, or the I call I don't call them animal ethics committees, I call them animal experimentation committees, they, they are just helping on making decisions about um, giving licenses to animal research proposals. Um, as scientists um, doing animal experiments themselves, they regularly will vote for the proposed experiments. And by this, and the number of authorized experiments um, by the competent authority will not decline, but still rise. So basically it's, it's, it's kind of the person is uh, yeah, explaining the issues, yeah. um, you know, that, that basically it's, it built in system and there was another comment or question in the chat saying when it comes to funding you know that in the the funding bodies if you have those you know animal using scientists obviously they they will fund um peers that that are also using those animal models so yeah the same question again how do can we move forward how can we yeah and like have more scrutiny when it comes to um you know those licenses giving out those licenses i mean uh, i can just say as a former inspector it is really really difficult because just to to say a little bit of my own work um you have limited time to assess the proposals you are an all-rounder you're not an expert in all the different uh, fields um generally those are veterinarians at least in germany so that doesn't mean that they all know much about nams you know and it's it's a full-time job to just keep updated with all the new developments in this field so uh, do you have any thoughts how can we change those animal experimentation committees make them more balanced how can we have more balanced funding bodies you know i was I quite would... surprised about the dfg position paper but it it also clearly said that this was the opinion of the uh, experimental animal committee. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, that is already right. showing that it's not that. Again, balanced. the word opinion, isn't it? So I would be very much in favor of getting more objective information out. So asking systematic reviews for what evidence is already out there? What is the argumentation behind your animal model? Make it clear, do a systematic review or a scoping review, make it clear what you found and what is already out there in those 35 million papers in PubMed. <laughs> and I would also think we should make the three R search obligatory, our EU directive 
tells us the three R's are an obligation. We don't live up to that. So make the search for replacement obligatory. Let show where you have been looking for replacement, what you found and what could work or not and why not. So I think we are being too kind with all our rules and regulations, to be honest, and uh, we don't live up to our own rules. I, I, I like what Meryl is proposing, and I think maybe some other opportunities. I don't know how transparent this process is. If the, if the requests are fully published and, and open for evaluation. Um, and the other thing, I think, obviously, if, if there's a maybe not the expertise around the table to make this change happen, then it would also be looking and seeing how do you add more people to those boards who have got expertise in the animal safety science and could maybe offer some constructive challenges, as I think Mayor was advocating for, um, to make sure that those kind of three hour reviews are exhaustive and aren't just a, a tech box exercise for people. Systematic reviews uh, have been uh, financed by a Dutch funder and an impact study has been done and it appears that these systematic reviews lead to the motivation of the person that is doing the systematic review wanting to change. And so I think that's the best uh, education you can get to, to um, induce motivation with the person because you can say so much from the outside, doesn't it? Thank you for, for elaborating on this a little bit more because there was one critical comment in the, in the chat or in the Q and A box saying that oh the panel our panel is one sided. Obviously, our goal was to talk about innovation and human relevance. So um, that is why I invited the speakers I invited, and um, I think they clearly demonstrated how we have to move forward. And I think it's also very compelling when when you went through your own evolution in your career. Um, you started. Um, with the traditional animal models and, and you explained why you actually moved away from it. Um, I think that was quite convincing uh, to me and I hope for many of the listeners as well. Yeah, of so, course, I'm biased now. I have, a, but I'm very transparent in my bias where yeah. I want to yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's also a good point that obviously everybody is biased. Um, we all come in with our bias, but then we should look at sure. the evidence and hopefully make evidence-based uh, decisions. So I would say there are still some open questions, but we are almost at two and a half hours. So do you want? Do you both want to make some concluding remarks? What What do you hope for? What do you hope for the yeah science um, in the European Union, the future of it? Um, what do you think are the most important next steps to, to get this um, roadmap on, on the way? And um, yeah, maybe just some last, last thoughts of you. Well, I really would hope that the European Commission dares to take responsibility in this whole situation uh, on animal studies and alternatives and dares to make goals and a roadmap. Uh, we do that in economy all the time. The, we, we set a goal of 3% growth for next year. And if we get it or not, that's not so important. But this goal helps us to go on that road together. And I hope really that politicians in the European commissions are willing to take up this challenge. Thanks. Thanks, Meryl. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, okay. Um, so I, I would agree with Meryl. I, I think one thing I've taken from this is I think we need to be um, as passionate as we've been in this discussion about the ambition to realize the transition uh, to animal-free, non-animal approaches. I think it's, it's clear now that these approaches are moving to the, to the mainstream and the challenges we face and how do we support people through that transition to ensure that people do come with an unbiased approach when they're thinking about whether they need an animal test, they don't see it as the default, is one of the big challenges. Whilst we've been talking um, 
over 2,000 people have added their signature to the ECI. So thank you if it was anyone on this call. Um, I, I can only encourage everyone to keep engaging in this way. I think this has been an excellent discussion as we start to explore all the different challenges, all the different facets of how do we make this transition and we just need to keep these discussions going because uh, that's, the, that's the way we move forward together. Thank you very much. This was oh, that were wonderful last statements, um, and yeah, thanks again to our wonderful expert speakers. I'm I'm very inspired now, and I think yeah, and maybe Thomas is right, and we yeah, the 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 we will see maybe we will see in our lifetime this um, next scientific revolution. Um, hopefully it does come suddenly very quickly <laughs> so thank you very much Meryl and Gavin it was wonderful to speak to you today and um, I hope we will have nice other additional um, discussions in the future about this and maybe some great news to share and new ideas um, how to yeah further um, those efforts thank you very much and have a good evening or afternoon wherever you tuned in from